be assembled in your house, Father. Father, we can sing praises to you and uplift you. And Father, we just thank you for everything that you have provided for us. Father, as we have this long weekend dedicated to labor, we just thank you for those who have worked and toiled, Father, to, to make our, and are toiling today, to make our nation a strong nation, Father, and those who have labored and toiled here to help to continue your work here in this place. Just now, as we go into our worship service, we ask that you be with Brother Dean. Father, be with each of us that we're, we're Father, we good listeners, and that we will take the word with us that are spoken today and help us each to live closer to you. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. <laughs> The meeting him this morning will be the wonderful cross and the uh, short box. You know, tomorrow is Labor Day. Um, of course, that was a day created by Congress to uh, honor the men and work, working men and women to continue uh, to continue to make our country strong. Like many other days, it has changed in me to become a celebration of the last weekend of summer. As Christians, we are fortunate that the Lord's Day has not become a celebration of something other than its original intent. A day to celebrate God's love and Jesus' labor of love. Yes, Jesus did labor for us. He traveled rough terrain with no place to call home to share his message of salvation. In his ultimate labor of love, he bled and died on a cruel cross, bearing the burden of our sins. As we share in this time, partaking of his body and his blood, represented here, do not lose sight of Jesus' labor of love that brings us here today. Communion here this morning is a wonderful cross. Oh, my God. 
Father, we are so blessed to be in your house to praise your awesome grace. We thank you for all the wonderful things that you do for us in our everyday lives. And most of all, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who paid the ultimate price, died on the cross for our sins, and rose up to show us the direction we need to go by following your word and your scriptures. As we come this time for our service to give back to you, let's give back with a very open heart. Bless those who can't give. Bless those who just don't so fortunate to thank you. This is in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. <laughs> This morning is to keep us by name as we go to our conversation. Conditions <coughs> uh, and updates, as always, pray for those who need to make a decision, also those who are falling away. Um, also, Case Turner for health related concerns, Mr. President Kennedy. <coughs> Gabby Bird also for health related. Medina Gregory had surgery this past week. Uh, Gene Raver had surgery this past week and is now home. Also, uh, Richard Mary Case, Mary is in for a scan this week. Lou Hall has been improving more this past week. Mandy Moore as she heads into the service. Karen Bass has received treatments. Um, Doris Christie, and Doris for health related. Diane Grimes as she continues her treatments. The Lauren Rex Walker family and Lauren's passing. Uh, the situation in Syria was, was quite troubling. Uh, also, Jim Bill is in the hospital in Canada, so we ask him to continue with prayers. Uh, pray for Seal of Loma and his wife, Christy, that they can repair their marriage. And uh, this is Nancy Richard's son, so I ask you to have your prayer also. Prayer this morning is He Knows My Name. And, uh, following our prayer hymn, Brother Morning, Amen. Oh, and you see 
television, TV guide, and newspaper. They were that. And then they had to wait a year to implement that law. So they could bring the teachers up because so they would be able to, I don't know if that's true or not, he said it was, but the dumbing down of American society. In Luke chapter 2, verse 52, the Bible says that Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and in favor with man. What I'd like to propose this morning is that if you are just a little bit disturbed, hopefully a lot disturbed, at the intellectual, physical, spiritual, and social dumbing down of society, I think we've got some answers for us this morning so we don't become discouraged. If you've seen a decline over the years in regard to the high standards that we as a nation once held, how many of you have seen a decline? It seems like we've uh, fallen a great way. When I was a kid, the rules at school were no gum, no talking without permission. Those were the basic ones. You know. Now it's leave your guns at home, basically. You know, all that sort of stuff. Present-day standards have really declined in the past. The question I want to ask this morning is this. Is it possible that our slack in our allegiance to the intellectual, that's where in Luke 2.52, it says that Jesus increased in wisdom, Spiritually, he also increased not just in wisdom but the physical and in, in stature. And he also increased in spiritual stature before God, favor with God. And he also increased in the social disciplines in his life as he grew in favor with man as well. Is it possible that our slack in allegiance to these four areas the intellectual, the physical, the spiritual, and the social? Is it possible that our lack of allegiance to these four areas has distanced us from God and created, if you please, a great chasm or separation from Him? Have you seen it in relationships with people where love of men has grown cold? I do not believe, brethren, that our distance from God is because of God's inability to save, but rather, as the scripture says in Isaiah chapter 59. His hand's not too short to say it's really our sins that have separated us from him. So it's not God's inability to say it that's placed us where we are. Distance seems to be the best word I can find this morning. Is it possible that it's because of refusal to in all our ways acknowledge him? Refusal to in all arenas of life to crown him, Lord, and welcome him as Lord of that arena, to claim that he is the sole authority and the supreme head of all things. I mean, imagine it if you would, if the NEA would come out tomorrow and say, we have a new policy, Jesus is Lord of the NEA. Of course, for that to occur, though, in the NEA, you must personally have Jesus as Lord, right? Wouldn't it be something if the WHO, someone said who? Yeah. <laughs> WHO, the World Health Organization, would be something they came out in the physical realm and said, you know what, Jesus is going to be Lord of our policies and our approaches to the physical well-being of mankind. Would be something in the COC, that's nothing in the Church of Christ, would be something if every church truly said, Jesus is the head of this congregation, he's Lord. On Wednesday nights in our studies, uh, one of the things I handed out this last Wednesday night was some of the quotes of our founding fathers and why I feel it's so important to, to turn back to the Bible. But basically, I want to explain something this morning. Please understand that even if George Washington, James Madison, Patrick Henry, and others like them, even if they had not believed that God's word is essential to the well-being of mankind, I still believe God's word is essential. Because I have an authority that's higher than George Washington. I'm an authority higher than James Madison. Higher, higher authority than that of Patrick Henry, and it's this, that Jesus Christ is the Lord. And that's really where it is. And so if Jesus would also be Lord of the DOSS, the Department of Social Services, wherever we are, every one of those arenas deal with those four areas, the intellectual, the physical, the spiritual, and the social, every one of those arenas then would become superior to any other arena that is dominated by world philosophy. Now the road back to Christ. How many of you think that's a difficult road, right? Man, it's so tough. 
find our way back. But I would submit this morning that the road back to Christ is no more difficult than the road to him was initially. Because the Bible says he dwelt where? When he became flesh, he dwelt among us. Can you say that? He dwelt among us. That means if we were on the planet today, and we were the only place gathered to worship in the whole world, he would be here today among us. The beauty of it is, in the spiritual realm of the kingdom of God, everywhere the true believers gather, he is among us. Even now, he is among us. I don't know for this particular seat he's sitting, but he's the most important <coughs> listener in the audience today that I see. Leaves. That means he is accessible. At one time he was visible. He was within the people's reach. He was a very present help, as the psalmist said in the Old Testament. He's an advocate. Even now he's our mediator between God and man. He's the cure for all our infirmities. He is intellectually, spiritually, physically, and socially, when he was on the planet, superior to all others. And when he becomes Lord of each of these areas in life, then that arena becomes superior to all of the rule by world philosophy. Sadly, we're anemic. Anybody know what that word means? By the way, it's too early for that word. Anemic. <coughs> my mind is, I'm sorry, the appropriate kind of word. Sandy, you're looking a bit anemic. I know I can pick one. What does that mean to be anemic? Well, it means to be weak, sickly, it means to be not well. And, and, and why are we anemic? Why are we like those at the church of Corinth? Paul said, some of you are weak, some of you are slip sick, and some of you are asleep. Well, we're anemic in three areas. We're going to talk about two this morning. One, we are anemic in regard to righteousness. Two, we are anemic in regard to being godly with contentment. And we are anemic in service to others. I want to touch on number three because it's really not included in my message today. I ran out of pages. And I figured if I run out of pages, we'll probably run out of time. So, how many of you understand that love is the holds relationship together? Put it down in the chat, put it down. We have grown anemic and weak in regard to service to others. Instead, it seems now we're going out from numero uno, the guy in the mirror, we're going out from me. Jed's first word was me. I told you this before, but I tell you, in the mind of the carnal nature that he is at such an early age, you know, in a few months, I was hoping it was his dad or something like that. His dad, dad, pop, pop. You know, the other kids would usually, ha, ha, you know. His dad was always off to work. You know, his son was always, mom, mom, mom. And finally, my like, dad or whatever they call me. And then Jed's go, Jed's first word was, me, and me, me. Just woke up that morning and was standing in the street, brown, defiant eyes looking at me, me. He went, me eat! It was his first, first sentence. His first word and his first sentence the same day. It was all about him. Numero uno. Now, if we're honest, that describes us pretty well. So, when the love of many is growing cold, I believe we are anemic in that area because of the deprivation of service. Not asleep, but of service to others. What's this about righteousness, by the way? Anemic in regard to doing what is right. Could it be it's due to a deprivation of the sun, a lack of exposure to the sun? Not the S U N, but the S O N. To, as in the words of the Psalm America, again, understand the truth that when you eliminate the Word of God from the classroom and from politics, you, in essence, are eliminating the nation. That word protects. That's why our founding fathers, more importantly, Jesus Christ, brought us the word of truth. It wasn't just give us a bunch of rules and regulations to be a big mean God up in the sky and you do this or else. It was a God who knew that if we would live within certain parameters, certain limits, he knew it would be for our good and for our health and our wholeness. And that's why he says there in the Old Testament, he says, If you seek me with all your heart, then you will find me, Jeremiah chapter 29. When you seek for me with all your heart, then you will find me. And I will restore your fortune. I'll heal your sicknesses. I'll be with you 
and I'll draw on him to you. There's also an anemia in regard to godliness with content. And I believe it's in large part due to what Brother Lou was addressing this morning, deprivation and prayer. In fact, Ray Bass used to say, my father in law was a minister of the gospel, he used to say he believed there were two things killed in the church. And I believe it killed his personal devotion to Christ as well. It says, the morning says we don't pray. Number two, we don't read God's word. Because we're too busy. Too busy. How many of you dream dreams and in the dreams you're busy? And then you wonder why you wake up so tired. Oh, I dreamt last night I was on the run. In every dream, I was on the run. Hurry, 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 scurry, 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 hurry, 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 hurry. And then I woke up on the last night. It's like, I prayed this morning. I said, Lord, tonight I'm going to go to sleep. Tonight is a dream that, a, a dream that I'm sleeping. <laughs> that I'm resting. That I'm beside the still waters. I'm actually taking time to talk to you. This is not about calls that are dropped. You know, you've been talking to someone on the phone before, right? You ever have this happen? You're talking, and you're the one talking. You usually have them on the cell phone, and you're blah, 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 and you've got a long statement that you're trying to finish out. And unbeknownst to you, there was a, you know, something that just kind of like, what? You know, and you didn't hear it. And it wasn't them hanging up on you. The call was dropped. And it's like, oh, dude, you know, are you still there? And it was like, nothing. And so, and then you get the call coming in, and it's down, and say, okay, we're going to lose them. It's this prayer deprivation. It's not like God dropped the call. It's more like He never picked up and made the call in the first place. Prayer deprivation. You ask anyone in Jesus' day, hey, when you sought for Christ with all your heart, did you find Him? You ask anyone in the Old Testament, when you sought for God with all your heart, did you find Him? Jeremiah chapter 29, verses 11 through 14. God says, I know how, I know the plans I have for you. I have plans for welfare for you. So if you'll seek me with all your heart, you'll find me. And if you ask those in the Old Testament, you ask those during the time of Jesus, and you ask anyone to fast forward from there up to the day, when you search for God with all your heart, did you find him? And I ask you that this morning. Did you? You asked the paralytic in Mark 2. From the Lord to the roof by his four friends because he couldn't get to Jesus because of the crowd. He seemed inaccessible. So you ask him, hey, when you sought for the Lord with all your heart, did you find him? That's what it is. You ask the woman in Luke chapter 8 with the issue of blood who couldn't get to Jesus because of the crowd, yet she continued to press through the crowd. She had that determination. She didn't let it deter her. You ask her, hey, were you able to find him? She said, yes. I was able to find him. You ask Zacchaeus who climbed the sycamore tree. So many people couldn't be seen, so he ran and hid climbed the sycamore tree so he could see Jesus. You remember Jesus come up and we used to sing when we did Zacchaeus was up in that tree and Jesus said, You come down right now. Or I'm coming to your house today. And Jesus did. Salvation came to his house that day. You asked Zacchaeus, Hey, when you sought for Jesus with all your heart, were you able to find him? Zacchaeus would say, Sure did. You ask that Canaanite woman who was not a Jew who begged for mercy. And the Lord said, listen, you're, you're not of the Jewish nation. I've been sent to the Jews. But she kept persisting there in Matthew chapter 15, <coughs> verses 21 to 28. And she said, yes, Lord, but even the dogs get the crumbs. And she persisted. She kept begging for mercy. And Jesus says to her, woman, your faith is great. Be it done for you as you will. I write that down. Be it done for you as you wish. Very good. What's that? Very good. Amen. Because when I look in the mirror and I see things in my life that are not happening as they ought to in God's way of living, in God's way of righteousness, in God's way of prayer life, I realize that it's being done unto me as I wish. And if I want things to change the way God wants them to be in my life, I've got to start wishing it the way that God wishes it. And if I'll do that, then God will see that it is done for me as I wish according to his will. I'll be able to say goodbye to him here. <laughs> you ask the two blind men in Matthew chapter 20 who were crying out. As the crowd around them said, be quiet, shut up. 
You guys making too much commotion. We're trying to see Jesus. We're not like, be quiet. I didn't think the Bible says they cried out all the more. And Jesus heard them and was accessible by them. You asked them, when you sought for Jesus with all your heart, were you able to find him? He said, yes. Now we see. You asked the parents in Matthew chapter 19 who brought their children, their babies, in Matthew 19, 13, <laughs> that he might lay his hand on them and pray. Remember what the disciples did? They said, praise be to Jesus. The children are here. Let's start a Christian school. Is that what they said? Absolutely not. They said, get those kids out of here. He doesn't have time for them. And Jesus rebuked them. And what an electrifying moment as he sat them on his lap, he laid his hands on them and prayed <coughs> for their kids. Remember a few weeks ago when the Pope was going through, I don't know where he was, there were thousands gathered and he didn't have on a bulletproof anything or whatever. His windows weren't up on his little whatever that is. And did you see the did you see the clip where the crowd actually broke through and touched him? They were going crazy. They were ecstatic. <laughs> they were so excited. Can you imagine the electricity in the crowd? Parents realized that their kids were sitting on the lap of Jesus. And Jesus laid his hands on the kids. To me, that's the amazing thing about God's grace. All of this. What's that? But his power is amazing, yes. His might, his wisdom. His eternal nature, all of that is amazing. But what's captured my attention in the last few days is how accessible he is. Can I call the president today, see if he takes a call? <laughs> I didn't say with the president, we thought about something still there. I don't know what it is. Just call somebody important. There's times I call the beginning. No fault of his own. I can't get through to the mechanic. He's not here right now. He'll call you. He does. He does. Try calling somebody important, some dignitary. Hey, how many get frustrated even when you call me? Not that I'm all that important. He gets his little things and I do this. Be No, I'm not listening to my ringtone. You know why you wait. To me, that's what's amazing about his grace is that he's so accessible, so easy to access. He's right there. The Bible says in Acts 17, verse 27, where Paul had taken an opportunity to preach to a people that were so superstitious, so idolatrous, and they had idols everywhere. They worshiped under all these different idols the God of thunder, the God of the sun, the God of the moon, the God of this, and the God of fertility, and the God of Anyhow, they, they, they didn't want to offend any of the gods. God did with thank you, Liz. Thank you to so and so. Thank you to so and so for doing this. Thank you to so and so for doing that. I grew up in a church where if you, if you miss somebody, this ever happened, Richard? You just passed before I was. If you miss somebody and then say thank you to somebody and we left them out, what happened? You got hate mail, right? Oh, no, oh, man, go back. You, you didn't thank me. And, and these people were like that. See, we don't, we don't want to leave that. And so they had a God that they actually made an idol. And just in case we left out one, they called it the unknown God. And so while Paul was in Athens on Mars Hill, there he waited for his traveling companion so he can head on praise the gospel in other territories. He sees the city given over to idolatry, and he's kind of perturbed by it. The spirit's moving with him, and he sees this idol to be the unknown God. He says, Hey, I'd like to tell you about him. And Paul begins to preach about the God that. Richard read this morning from Genesis 1. I have an idea he mentioned. In the beginning, God created this is the God who made us from one, from he made all nations from one. Well, he made all nations from one man. And he spoke about Adam, he spoke about Eve, he went through the I don't know how long it took him to get to Jesus and the cross and the resurrection, but when he did, some began to steer. Others have said, we'd like to hear more about this. And there were several that were converted to Jesus Christ. And in that message, I think one of the one of the chords that struck the heart was Acts 17, verse 27. It struck mine when I read it when Paul said, quote, He is not far from each one of us. Do you know that this morning? Do you believe that? How close is it? How close is it? Can you uh, finish the phrase? No, no prizes given today, all right? 
Draw near to God. Draw near to you. James chapter four verse eight. Someone says, "Well, how come? How come we gotta make the first move?" God already made His move. God already sent His Son. He already sent prophet upon prophet before that. Now I send my son to reference my son. They kill him. One day his son will come again. How about this one? Come unto me, all ye that I have labor and I have labor. I'll give you rest. Matthew 11, verse 28. How about this? How often I would have gathered you under my wings, but you would have none of it. As we cried over Jerusalem in Matthew 23, verse 37. All in the kingdom that God wanted to draw near, always has wanted to draw near. How about this one? His name should be called Emmanuel, which translated means. Okay, that's a little early. I know it's a Christmas Christmas. Okay, so 16 weeks away, guys. Get that. <gasps> Big panic all of a sudden. <gasps> His name will be called Emmanuel, which translated means, I heard it, God with us. Isaiah 7 14, as it was prophesied. Matthew 1, verse 23, fulfilled. And one day in Revelation 21, verse 3, when we're in heaven, the Bible says God will be among us. We'll be his people. There'll be no more death, no more crying, no more suffering. God with us. To me, that's an amazing thing about his grace. He's so accessible. I'm going to speak to the president later. <coughs> Not going to work, is it? That's not a special appointment. I speak to the boss. I was going to tell you all about very few You do both of them. Fortunately, the boss is there. The West Virginia Chief Raven. How about this one? The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. John chapter 1, verse 14. How about this? If any man love me, he'll keep my word. My Father will love him, and we will come and make our abode. With him. In other words, we're going to make our home with him. If any man loves me, he will obey my teaching, Jesus said. And the Father and I, we will come and we'll live within them. John 14, verse 23. He truly is not far from any of us. Then in the book of Romans, chapter 10, verses 12 through 13, the Bible says, there is no distinction between the Jew and the Greek. You know what that means? It is God's non respecter of persons. That's what got me riled up by what I shared with you, that little memo at the get go today. Is when the feds were requiring the Baptist churches, by the way, that are going to have to pay five for the permits. The feds were requiring them, trying to make it hard for them to be able to baptize. Yet at the same time, our government. Put out taxpayer money, the same article, to provide wash basins for Islamic kids in our schools who can wash their feet for the first time, also in the airports. One airport in Arizona went as far as even buy prayer carpets. You do that for the Christians, though, it's a violation of the Constitution. But yeah, we'll do it for Islamic faith 12 years ago. It's about to destroy it. Well, you know, not all Islam is like that. I know that. And I know not all Christians are really Christian as well. But when the Bible says in Romans 10, verse 12, that in God's eyes, there's no distinction whether you're Jew or Greek. He is still rich. He's the Lord of all, and he will abound in riches to all who call on him. That's the song we sang for children's church. I will, I will call upon the Lord. Romans 10 13 says, Whoever will call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. We've explained what that meant in other scriptures over the weeks past. Maybe you weren't here, so you need to go to Acts chapter 22, verse 16, in case you don't know what it means to call upon the name of the Lord. It's very similar to what Peter did when he was sinking in the waves that day, by the way. Remember what he said in two words as he sank in the waves? Lord, come. And uh, by the way, he's coming pretty close to a Martian, just let you know. He may have already gone under the water, he was walking in the water, and he started getting scared. Ah, he, started, he saw the wave, he was scared, he started to sink. 
For all I know, he may have been the person. So, Lord help! He called upon the Lord. And I'm just giving you that little side light so that when you look at Acts 22, verse 16, you understand the true meaning of what it means to call upon the name of the Lord. It does not mean lay your hand on the radio. It does not mean pray to sin and prayer. It means, why are you waiting to rise and be baptized and wash away your sins? Calling on the name of the Lord. That's what calling on the name of the Lord is. Is to get up from where you are, if you've not been immersed in the Christ, to do so. And as you're immersed in that water, you call upon the name of the Lord. My question to you this morning is, how accessible is God? When you call on the name of the Lord in your baptism, how long till he saves you? Eight minutes? 4.3 light years? 434 light years? Did it take that long? 434 years? Did it take 2.5 million years? How long? What's all this stuff about light years? I said, but it was suffering from deprivation from the sun, S O N. Does anybody know that the nearest star to Earth, by the way, the nearest star to the Earth is the sun. And uh, it's about 93 million miles from us. Now, for you, obsessive know, compulsive disorder, it's going about doing the math right now, take it twice and three. 93 million miles. Let's go, let's go. I don't want to be like those guys who are going, you're going to burn up? Be good, it's not a problem, we're going at night. So we'll go at night so we don't burn up. We'll get our little space vehicle that only we can afford. It's going. To, it's going to go. Where's that car? I already gave it to Grace tonight. We're going to go 100 miles per hour. That's moving on Earth. This is the thing. We hit 100, we hit 100 miles an hour. That day they called us. Mark can put on my support. Not always wanted to get a hundred, not thought this good kind of good. But I really didn't I didn't feel any pleasure in it. The car was starting. I don't think I don't think those cars were built like those race cars. Right? <laughs> the 33 won that one last night. But anyway, 100 miles per hour, we're moving. Moving said we're going to the sun and it's going to take us 106 years and 60 days to get there. I'm probably doing it that way. But if we were to go at the speed of light, 186,282 miles per second. By the way, if we had a vehicle to go that fast, we could go down to the equator with the Earth. Earth is the largest of its circumference. We need that vehicle. Vehicle's going to go at the speed of light, 186,282 miles per second. Seven times around the planet. I told you about law and papers in Ohio, Florida, California, but whatever. I've enjoyed going on vacation with that. Let's go off to the back. And we head off to the sun at the speed of light. We still won't make it for eight minutes. Eight minutes. But hey, we're having a good time with there in eight minutes. Let's go. Hey, look there. What's that next month to start there? That's the Proxima Centauri. Well, hey, we've got all day. It's only been eight minutes. Let's go to Proxima Centauri. Not a problem. But you call your boss 4.3 years later. Yeah. The nearest star, 4.3 light years. That's traveling 186,282 miles per second and doing it for 4.3 years straight. Well, that star over there is a lot brighter, though. Well, we go there, it's got to be closer. It's like, oh, the North Star, yeah. I mean, you ever heard of the North Star, right? Anybody know where it is? No. Uh, North Star. Oh, that's <laughs> it's, it's the bright one in the sky. <laughs> It looks a lot closer than Proxima Centauri. It's going to take four years, is it? Let's not do that. Let's go to the North Star. Sure. Hope you called the Undertaker. <laughs> Excuse me. I'm making a little image here. 434 light years away. Now, I've got good news for you. That was the old figure. They recently discovered something. Here's the part that's about 323 light years. <laughs> we just still have to call Warrior John, okay? Somebody out there. Or Cosby. You're not coming. Then we're out there one night and said, ah, that's not a good idea. But oh, what's that there? Say, well, actually, what you're looking at right now, that's the Andromeda Galaxy. You ever hear of the Andromeda Galaxy? It's called M31. 
It's, it's, a, it's an entire galaxy of stars. They say there are trillions of stars, just like on the sun, just in that galaxy. And they say that it is the most distant object you can see with the, with the unaided eye, without the use of a telescope. It's the most distant object you can see in the night sky. Why don't we go there? Not a problem. 2.5 million light years away. 2.5 million years traveling at the speed of light just to get there. And when we do get there, we realize that's just the beginning of the universe. I've got good news for you this morning. That God's a lot more accessible than those stars out there. The Son of God, God's Son, is much more accessible than the Earth's Son. Follow me? Eight minutes to get to the Sun, S U N. Look according to Romans chapter 6, as well as Ephesians chapter 2, as well as 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and 1 Corinthians 15, and Revelation 1. Just throwing out a bunch of things. But the Bible says when we're buried with Christ, we're what? Raised with Christ when? Right then. Ephesians says not only are we raised with Christ, we're seated with Christ. The Bible says we're reigning with Christ. The Bible says when the trumpet sounds, how long will it be until we're in the air and we meet him in the cloud? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. That's an amazing thing to me as to how accessible he is. And so when we sing, have you been to Jesus? Are you washed in the blood? That's how accessible he is. Yes, our society, as we go out this week, I just want to warn you, it's run away from that's amazing. How close he is to us. He saves us in baptism as quickly as he saved Peter. You do understand, don't you, that if when Peter cried out for help. Lord help! You do realize that if Jesus had waited even eight minutes, he didn't do that. Praise be to God, he has shown himself strong in our path to support us, those who earnestly seek him with our hearts as we stand and we sing and we commit this week, regardless of what others do, whether our forefathers had ever acknowledged our faith in God, may we, because of what Jesus taught and the apostles taught, solely committed to the authority of Jesus Christ. Realize he truly did not fall. Many of us. Go ahead, if you will. Let's stand for the sun. And we made to you, you see my the blood of the my holy trust in the graces of my watch in the blood of the Lamb. I watch in the blood, in the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb. My God and Father's holy might, and so I watch in the blood of the Lamb. I walk in there by the sea of the sun, I wash in the blood of the Lamb. The rest each time I hear the fruit sing by, I wash in the blood of the Lamb. I wash in the blood, in the soul of the cleansing blood of the Lamb. I are your sons in the blood of the Lamb. When the bridegroom comes, will we wash in the blood of the Lamb? Will your be ready for the I wash in the blood of the Lamb. I wash in the blood of the Lamb. In the soul, and in the blood of the Lamb, I run to the spot of the soil in my hands, so I wash in the blood of the Lamb. When they heard the gospel in Philippi, the dealer heard the message. How long will he respond? Singing, power. I hear that always changes. 